But hi, Sergei. Nice to see you here in Helsinki. Hey, everyone. Hi. Uh, is this your first time in Helsinki, I have to ask? <laughs> no, that's not. I already was in Helsinki once, but yeah. not so actually. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to see where people are physically when they are actually virtually in Helsinki. But it's nice to see you here. And um, the topic of taxes and, and kind of traffic and, and APIs is a very big thing in Finland, actually, uh, from from recent times because of all of this uh, opening up the, of the legislation to let um, all, all manner of operators to kind of run, uh, drive here, uh, not just the licensed taxis. And I think that something like that is happening or has been happening in other countries too. But how how is the situation from your point of view? Is the legislation there or is, are the APIs first? Well, so, actually, we have Yandex Taxi is working in yeah. Finland as a younger the local brand. Yeah. I'd say the situation is a failing business is like sort of complicated. Of course, the legislature is very big issue. Yeah. But uh, that's not only about the, let us say, licensing, but also all the IT legislatures, which are now very abundant and pose another challenge for international companies. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was participating as a consultant in the uh, Finnish legislation for um, re that required and made it possible actually for the the different companies to operate in Finland, but also required APIs from all the uh, traffic operators, which was kind of interesting because a lot of the the different traffic operators were actually totally international. From from taxis to air uh, airplane and, and and flight companies. So I actually it was an interesting thing to get you here as a speaker because you will kind of bring uh, a more international perspective to the <laughs> to our national <laughs> issues. But it wasn't easy for all the national operators either to open the APIs or build the APIs, and still isn't. So that is one thing, and of course to adapt to the uh, change in the competition. But I think that we are almost ready to st start your presentation. So you're going to talk to us about the quick, quick growth forced change from legacy to decoupled spec generated and simple microservices. So <clears throat> I guess this is a very technical topic, but I think that you had some business reasons behind doing that change. Uh, of so interesting nothing, to hear. That is nothing in techniques to change without business reason. Oh, I just love you saying that because that is something I've been repeating and repeating <laughs> and still I get sometimes answers that, hey, it's only a technical thing. There was no business reason and that is not the answer I'm looking for. But hey, are you ready to share your slides and start up? So then uh, we- I'll try to share the screen. Yes, try to share the screen and since and I will stay here until you successfully do so. Yeah, since I'm and not seeing myself since since I start <laughs> sharing screen, please tell me that everything is okay. Yeah, I, I will, I will. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated if you don't have two screens and, and then it gets even more complicated. Now I see your um, slides and if you put them into presentation mode, we are ready to go. Yes, that looks good. I'll leave you to it. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, the talk in the program had a very long title, so I decided to make it much shorter, just API-driven development. And before we started, the short intro to understand why we are discussing all of that. Uh, Yandex Taxi is a uh, one of the largest right handed services in the world. And since uh, 2017, 20, 2018, actually, 2017, we announced the deal. In 2018, we finished the deal with Uber. 
So we are a joint venture. We are operating in 15 countries, including the former seas, uh, Finland, and some other countries like uh, Ghana or Romania. And we had the very huge growth track. Um, I think I, that's quite common for startups, but for us, it was all in you, of course. We made our first billion rights in five years, ended in 2018, and made it nearly so in 2019 alone. So for years, we had constant 100% or so growth. And uh, we also add several new related businesses, like much, mostly about delivery, it's delivery, grocery delivery, parcel delivery, and so on. And they are growing even more rapidly. So, uh, when that all started, we had a Python analysis, but that's like sort of around world. We simply said, have some Python service, and eventually it became the large service, what we would name a monolith. In uh, 2017, we understood that we could not long leave the uh, like this setup, and we started to rewrite the architecture, and eventually we ended up having several monoliths. In 2018, we had three different products, several different monolith services in several languages, and we understood that right now we need to do something or we won't be able to grow anymore. I'm not saying that this problem is somehow unique. I think that our startup goes through this phase when they grew too fast to understand how to change the architecture in the right way and eventually found themselves in a situation where they have like one try to rebuild the architecture. So what we had in, in the beginning of uh, 2018, uh, first of all, this monolith was a single point of failure. Let us say several single point of failure. I mean that if something happens with the monolith, nothing worked. So whatever was the reason of monolith problems, you like, can't do anything. Your service isn't working until you fix it. Uh, the common problem of all large code bases long build and testing and deploy pipeline like literally hours if you are unlucky days until you got your code to be shipped into production. Uh, we because of this rapid growth our documentation was always outdated. Since new features were coming and coming and coming and of course we all forgot to write documentation or forgot to like write some details about how they had implemented the functionality and so on. And that uh, resulted, of course, the problems with integrating developers, because understanding the whole monolith, several of them actually is like a big issue. So uh, let me illustrate the problem with like single API handle. We had the handler named taxi on the way, abbreviated as TOTW. That's a single endpoint being called repeatedly while the ride is in progress by client, I mean, uh, client application. So we had every problem we could, like lots of several fields, lots of JSON fields in this endpoint. Different teams maintain that. And since uh, the product is growing, people are going to and fro and so on, 
the regularly had a situation where they simply don't know what this field means actually. Like it wasn't documented, not work as documented, or simply nobody knows what it does. So from other side, the internal architecture of that single handler was like extremely complicated. Lots of different requests to other HTTP services or databases, uh, caches, and so on. And like we understood that uh, the solution is to try to split your functionality into several services. And we actually tried microservices at that point, but the fun thing, they didn't work. Like, we had the, for example, chat between driver and rider implemented as a microservice, but it was still able to affect the monolith. If chat wasn't working, the entire monolith, monolith would not work. That was, of course, awesome situation, and we like started to plan. We uh, understood that we like can't allow it to exist in this state. So we formulated what we want from the microservice architecture. We wanted easiness to development new services, new businesses, like. Uh, short pipelines, uh, easy to learn, stop spreading new monolith written in different languages and we want control over it. We need to ensure that the entire setup is reliable. We wanted actual documentation. We wanted that all this large thing degrades as graceful as possible. And we need something to do with like handlers which could do everything like the one I described on the previous slide. So that the point we started. There is a joke very popular in Yandex that developers are people who take JSON from one socket and put it into another socket. And we decided no, developers should not do that. Every single task which is like move JSON from source one source and put it to into the server response shouldn't be the task to write code. So we had six decisions. One of them is microservices. I think that's not new and obvious. So others are directly related to the API. That's why I'm here on API days. Uh, what we mean by API first development, API driven development, you could not write code until you write the API specification. You simply can't do anything. We made this happen uh, with extensive use of code generation code generation from the spec. We used the open API CE and we generate clients in several languages like C++, Python, and client languages like TypeScript. All the clients to the uh, API endpoints are shared, so we may ensure that all the microservices have the actual version of the API client. And uh, that also guaranteed that we would never have the citation when some field is simply undocumented. While it's undocumented, you can't use it in your code. So we got documentation. It might be, of course, more or less well written and so on, but it is always present and there is no situation when it's absent at all. We have uh, the microservices using the actual code. We have the advantage of front-end and mobile code being right simultaneously or even ahead of time since you have the spec, you have the examples of the like, JSON from which this spec returns. And you may write the code already 
even that is, when that is not vacant at all. And we go to the some parts of like graceful degradation I will discuss later. So the second step, we had this situation. There are clients making requests. They are carrying the client secrets like cookie tokens, happy keys, and so on. And if we allow every microservice to check the secrets, your system is extremely fragile. You may like fail in every single micro in every single microservice and make a like, uh, hole in the security. So, but if you not not check permissions, it makes the system even more vulnerable. So our decision was like to have an abstraction which checks the secrets on the front services which are connected to the client and sign them. After that, the microservices only check signature. They do not check client secrets and actually don't know what the client secrets are. And what it also extremely helped us in terms of API because we have the possibility to like, standardize what IDs, what pieces of like client context and application context are passed. We made it in that way that every microservice pass the context exactly in the same manner that in which they got the context. So uh, we had some grade of unification. The microservices started to operate in the same terms, naming the things in a consistent manner. Third step is API gateways. That's about moving JSON. We had lots of situations when we simply took the response of some internal service, make some simple transformation, like combine several of them, need some fields, something like that, and return it to the client. And we like made it a task which isn't about writing code. You just write in the spec. Like there are sources, A, B, C, combine them in that way and return. Why that's better than writing code? Since it is a very small subset and very controllable. You like cannot do whatever you want. And you can't write business logic in it. We specifically made this uh, API gateways in a manner that excludes any using of uh, no, like a, any logic a part of combining answers and having fallbacks for apps. And we got centralized uh, control over the policy. How many retries there will be? How what timeouts there are? How errors are happening? And so on. So we had these three parts. We have um, authentication authorization proxy between the mobile and like front end clients and the microservices. We had API gateways to combine the microservice answers. And we have shelf clients to every API endpoint. What does it mean? And that means that we could have a control all over the technical parts of this structure. Like you're writing the configuration, like how many attempts you made, what are timeouts, what are endpoints, what data you need to be included in the set of headers which are identified. And you automatically got the dashboards which illustrates this configuration, like what are the request per seconds number, how many errors we got, what uh, timings we got, and so on. That was one part we like, made our objective by, by in 2018 to achieve. And that also made us, made 
it's possible to deal with the endpoints like we discussed before. API Gateway allows the like fat uh, legacy endpoints to make them step by step lightweight and uh, controllable with simply using API Gateway start like splitting internal uh, operations. Some JSON, the JSON fields are being filled from other microservices. And uh, the authorization proxy helps us in that, in that because you don't need to know what actually written in the monolith, what is the context of the operation. Contexts are all the same. And we automatically got the like, dashboard of the health of the, the set points. What microservices deal with, what are the current state, and where the problem, if there is a problem. These things are quite technical, but there are things we need to do with, like, from an administrative point of view. We need to be sure that everyone in the company, and we had a large company at that point, doing things right way. That's why we established the API and architecture review. Like every time the team makes new service or tries to like uh, to refactor the existing service, they are filling the form to the API committee. The task of this form is quite simple to help team leaders like to ask proper questions. So how, what you rely on, what services relies on you? What happens if your service is down or your dependent service is down? And uh, which data are streaming through your service and so on. So you may ask like how we measure the result. Well, the main result of all the thing is the Fellows, we have zero outages since December 2018. By outage, I mean the service is not working. Of course, we had uh, like small issues, some microservice isn't working. But the like main component, the core business service, never stopped working since that. We were able to grow team rapidly in that, like three times over two years. And we, we never planned that, but our new businesses, which were like, which had the, their figures doubled or tripled through several months of the current corona crisis, were doing extremely well. We had no problem with like scaling them or some kind of outage and so on. So, that's the end of my presentation. If you, if you have some questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you, Sergey. It, it has been a really interesting presentation, and I think that you have encountered some of the, the issues and, and, and challenges, but also kind of the good side of, of using microservices. And it's not always uh, so simple. I have some questions in mind too, and we have the whole questions and, and answers session, but uh, Tuukka here has a question. So are some of these APIs used outside of Yandex, and did you consider if GraphQL uh, could solve some of your challenges? You know, one of the things I like about conferences is having hidden slides. Yay! <laughs> so Tuukka had uh, clearly somehow <laughs> telepathically communicated this question to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we considered, of course, GraphQL. We had external integrations, of course. Well, theoretically, uh, the thing I don't like about GraphQL is that it's very object-oriented. We had plenty of APIs, like someone well designed, some not so well, and they were not simply like 
being tailed to feed the GraphQL model. And that's that's theory. In practice, that was very simple. Like we already had open API specs, and to like write tools to have them supported was easier than try to customize GraphQL. That choice was like yeah. mostly about the expenses. So what we kind have, of clients you have like using those APIs? Would, would you say that there was a kind of a thing that the client applications didn't benefit from using GraphQL that much? Or I'm saying that to adapt GraphQL to infrastructure was less just like more expensive than yeah. right around tools. And, and uh, I'm not telling about the clients. Mm. Do you have a lot of cases? I, I I can imagine that you have a lot of cases where you actually update and delete and create data, and not just query it. So that is also something that might not uh, kind of take away the benefits of using GraphQL if the use cases are kind of specific. Well, the main problem is that our use cases are, are like very. What would be the right word? Scattered all over the surface. Mm -hmm. We have APIs for the partners, which is very specific, yeah. which is very specific. We have APIs for like other services within Yanx, which is very specific again. And I, we can of course try to move to GraphQL, but like, why? Yeah, I mean, like what's the point? Absolutely. We don't have a reason to do that. You should not do that. But it's a good thing to hear the kind of reason reasons why and why not. And uh, I I have some questions in mind about the microservices. And and you were saying that you kind of wanted to keep the uh, permissions and 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 the authentication as far away from the microservices. But you also have kind of that problem sometimes that people. Like the microservices need to know who is who is calling 